Well, I want to welcome the small number of you who are here today to help uh, to record this study and also the number of people who are watching online and joining our study of Scripture together with us through their computer or device. Uh, it's certainly uh, an encouragement that even in these strange times, the Lord is allowing us unusual means during unusual times to be fed and encouraged by His Word. And so as we take this time and set it apart on this Easter weekend, on this Lord's Day, uh, to bow before the Word of God, I want to begin our time together with a reading of Scripture from Matthew 28. And there in Matthew 28, we read this description of the resurrection. Now, after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow, and for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. As he said, Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. As we prepare it up, Go before God's word together and worship the Lord. Will you join me in prayer? Lord, we thank you for the truth and the power of the resurrection. We thank you that Jesus died for our sins on the cross and was laid in the tomb, but he did not stay there. You raised him by your infinite and eternal power, Father. And as a result of that, we can have new life, eternal life in Him. And Lord, in these strange and trying and even scary times, we thank You for this reminder that because of the resurrection of Christ, we do not need to fear. Just as Jesus told the women at the tomb that they did not need to be afraid, we do not need to be afraid because our Savior has risen. So even as we worship you and believe in you, we also confess that we do struggle with weak faith. We struggle with doubts. We see that even in the way that the current events in our day are distracting us from a pure focus on you. 
we confess that weak faith that leads to that and pray that you would help us to remember your final command to us, to your disciples through your ministry on earth when you reminded your disciples that all authority has been given to you. Help us to remember the authority that you have and help us to remember the commission that you've given us to make disciples so that your name might be glorified. And we pray also during these times that you would strengthen our faith in this reminder that you gave the disciples that as our resurrected Lord, you will be with us right to the end of the age. And so Lord, that's how we know even though we cannot be together and even though we're facing scary and confusing times, we can still do so with faith and confidence and assurance because you have risen from the dead and because you are with us. So with those truths in our hearts, we pray that you would strengthen our faith and we pray that you would encourage our souls through this time of study and meditation this morning. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we do have the opportunity to enjoy a few songs together. So Steve, you can come and lead us in a few songs. We do have the opportunity to sing praises this morning. A song of praise to the Lord is fitting, especially this Easter weekend, where we remember and celebrate and praise the Lord for his resurrection from the dead. We're going to begin by singing number 310, the resurrection hymn, number 310. I invite you, if you're able, you can stand with me. And if you're singing at home, as most of you are, uh, you should find the lyrics on the email that was sent out to the congregation. You can look on there. We're starting off with the resurrection hymn, See What a Morning. Let's sing. See what a morning, see what a morning, gloriously bright with the dawning of hope in Jerusalem. Folded the grave clothes, tomb filled with light as the angels announced Christ is risen. See God's salvation plan, wrought in love, born in pain, paid in sacrifice. Fulfilled in Christ the man, for he lives. Christ is risen from the dead. See Mary weeping. See Mary weeping. Where is he laid? As in sorrow she turns from the empty tomb. Here's a voice speaking calling her name it's the master the lord raised to life again the voice that spans the years speaking life stirring hope bringing peace to us will sound till he appears for he lives Christ is risen from the dead one with the father one with the father ancient of days through the spirit who closed faith with certainty Honor and blessing, glory and praise to the King, crowned with power and authority. And we are raised with Him, 
death is dead, love is one, Christ has conquered. And we shall reign with Him, for He lives, Christ is risen from the dead. And we are raised with Him, death is dead, love is one, Christ has conquered. And we shall reign with Him, for He lives, Christ is risen from the dead. Amen. We're going to continue singing a song of confession, hymn number 405. You can turn over to 405, Not in Me, or if you're looking on the email, you can scroll down and find the lyrics for Not in Me, and we'll continue to sing together. No list of sins I have not done. No list of virtues I pursue. No list of those I am not like can earn myself a place with you. Oh God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner through and through. My only hope of righteousness is not in me, but only you. No humble dress, no fervent prayer, no lifted hands, no tearful song, no recitation of the truth can justify a single wrong my righteousness is jesus life my debt was paid by jesus death my weary load was borne by him and he alone can give me rest no separation from the world no work i do no gift i give can cleanse my conscience cleanse my hands i cannot cause my soul to live but jesus died and rose again the power of death is overthrown my god is merciful to me and merciful in Christ alone. But Jesus died and rose again. The power of death is overthrown. My God is merciful to me and merciful in Christ alone. Amen. We have one more song to sing this morning. You can turn over to Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. Scroll down and find it in the email, and we'll sing of the blessings that we have in Christ and our union with him. Let's sing together. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, 
my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, his power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley he will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold my sin has been defeated jesus now and ever is my plea oh the chains are released i can sing i am free yet not i but through christ in me With every breath, I long to follow Jesus. For he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me. Until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold. My hope is only Jesus, all the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, all the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. Well, Steve, thank you for doing that and leading us this morning. I think probably if... Uh, there's one thing that's more awkward than uh, preaching through social distancing. It might be leading congregational singing through social distancing. So I appreciate you doing that for us this morning. And 
allowing us to benefit from that. Those of us who are here, and then of course those who are watching online, just to be encouraged, uh, to be able to sing along from a distance with the rest of our congregation. It's just an encouragement for me to think of all of us singing together on Sunday morning, even though we're apart. And it's a reminder that even though we are enduring this physical separation, we are still just as united in Christ as we've ever been. And the longing that we have to be back with one another and the longing that I have as your pastor to hear you singing as a congregation again, again, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. And it's a longing that transcends our desire to just get back together. It's a longing that looks forward to our worship in heaven when we'll be gathered together with all of the saints from all ages singing praise to our Savior. And so it's a wonderful reminder of what we have to look forward to. And it's a wonderful grace that the Lord provides us even during this temporary season of separation. So I'm thankful to be able to do this this morning. Thankful to be able to feed our souls through the word together. And as we prepare to do that, will you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, we do thank you that we can make our boast this, that we know you and your son, Jesus Christ, who is our Savior. We're so thankful that he died and rose again, that we might be your people and that we might be united in him as his body and that he might unite us together as one family. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen the cords that bind us together during this time. And we pray that you would encourage hearts that might be faltering. Lord, if there's one thing that trials can certainly do, it is expose our immaturities. And so we pray even as you do that purifying process in us as individuals and us as a congregation, Lord, help us to continue to run back to the work of Christ as our only plea and as a source of power to help us grow to be more mature. Lord, we pray even now that as we focus on your word and recognition of your resurrection, that you would bless this time of study and use it as a way to sustain our hungry hearts until we can return back to corporate worship. Lord, we thank you that we can pray in this way, and we trust that you not only hear these prayers, but you will answer them according to your good and kind will. And so we pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. This morning we're going to be looking at verses 19 through 23. And I've titled today's message, The Power of the Resurrection. Now, today we might be celebrating Easter in the strangest way that I have ever experienced in my lifetime due to this coronavirus outbreak. And it could be easy to think that Easter could not have come at a worse time this year since we're unable to all meet together. However, I think this is probably the perfect time for us as God's people to be focusing on on the power of the resurrection, God's power over death. And so that's what we're going to do as we look at Ephesians chapter 1 this morning. You can look with me in your copy of Scripture. I'll begin reading in verse 19. And here the Apostle Paul writes, And what is the immeasurable greatness of His power towards us who believe? According to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body the fullness of Him who fills all in all. Now, in the midst of this COVID-19 crisis, one of the things that has 
remained absolutely clear, if you're paying any attention at all, is that death is a formidable foe. We have, in our culture, been more insulated from death than any other culture in the history of the world up to this point. And yet, despite all the money, all the resources, and all the medical advances that we possess, we remain powerless to stop death. Life has a 100% fatality rate at this point. And what this COVID-19 pandemic has reminded us of is our own powerlessness to face death. And and not only has it reminded us of our powerlessness in the face of death, it's also a reminder that the world is enslaved to the constant fear of dying. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 15 speaks of those, when it's talking about the world, unbelievers, it says, those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. There's a kind of slavery that people don't often talk about, and it's the slavery of fallen mankind to the constant fear of death. And we see that bondage on display on our screens, whether it's your TV screen, your computer screen, or your device screen, all over the place. People are responding in fear, and we see this fear. Not only from the world, we see also Christians struggling to respond in joyful, trusting, loving kinds of ways, with a a Christ-like reasonableness that takes proper measures of protection but refuses to fall prey to worldly panic. These are the issues of our day, and these are the issues that have always existed. The world is constantly searching for solutions that are powerful enough to protect us from death. In fact, as I was thinking about this, I was reminded of a small town in Texas before World War II where there was a great tragedy. In this small town, a school burned to the ground, killing uh, almost 300 people. And you can imagine in a small rural town that when 300 people die, there's, there's not a family that's left unscathed by that tragedy. And in the wake of that tragedy, when it was time to rebuild this school, they decided as a community that they were going to invest in the world's most powerful sprinkler system so that this would never happen again. And so that's what they did. The, the, the community raised enough money to install a state-of-the-art sprinkler system to protect that school from ever burning to the ground again. And, and the community found great comfort and courage and strength in the power of this sprinkler system to insulate their children from the potential of death. And I was thinking about that because those are the kind of temporal solutions to death that people are destri- desperately searching out for in the midst of this crisis. If we could just find something to protect us, we would be okay. And granted, I'm praying for the Lord's protection. I'm praying for solutions from a medical perspective. Of course, we all are. And yet, we recognize that we live in a world where even if you don't die from a pandemic, you eventually will die from something. So we need a power that transcends temporal death. We need a power that can protect us from eternal death that's the only thing that can free us from this slavery to the fear of death and in ephesians chapter one in our passage this morning what we're reminded of is that the only thing powerful enough to defeat death to protect us from eternal death is the power of god in the resurrection of jesus christ we have the ultimate power, the power of God, that we can find comfort and courage in, even in the midst of the days in which we live. And that's why, rather than falling prey to the fear of this world, rather than falling prey into the, the opinionizing of fear-bound man, 
We desperately need to stand confidently on the power of God to protect us in this life, but ultimately and most importantly, to save us from eternal death. That's the only way we can sanctify the fears that are plaguing our culture. That's the only way we can insulate our hearts from falling back into the patterns that we lived in when we were in bondage to the slavery of the fear of death. We need to look to the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead. And that's what this passage focuses our attention on. Now, we're going to look especially at verses 20 through 23, but verse 19 is important for us to understand because it sets the context for what Paul is saying in this text. In verse 19, uh, Paul describes in a very vivid manner the absolute power of God when he says, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might. And and here we can see a number of, of amazing implications with respect to God's power from this text. For instance, we see that God's power is an infinite power. That's what Paul is talking about when he says that it is an immeasurable greatness, a a, a far exceeding greatness. God's power is inexhaustible. When when God created the world, he, He poured out His power in such a way that He created all things out of no things, and at the end of that, He still had an infinite power left over. His resources weren't drained. Why? Because His power is immeasurably great. It's an infinite power. It's also a uniquely divine power. Paul says that this immeasurable greatness is a part of His power. It's His power. It belongs to God. All all other powers, all other strength in this world is all derivative. It's all from God. But but God's power is inherent. God's power is a divine power, which means the power that we need to run to in the midst of these times and and the power that we need to run to for the salvation of our souls is found only in God. It's a divine power. And and what I find most remarkable about verse 19 is that this power is also a gracious power. It's immeasurable. It inherently belongs to God. But then Paul says the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. It's a gracious power. He uses His divine power unto us to bring about our undeserved and eternal good. And, and, and this gracious power, it's also an effective power. Because verse 19 finishes by saying, according to the working of His great might. It's like Paul ends this description of God's power with with one last apostolic exclamation point when he combines all these different words to describe God's power to to say that it is the working, it's the effectiveness of, of his awesome strength. It's an effective power. It's a power that we can trust because it is gracious and it always accomplishes what it sets out to do this is the power of God and this is the power that the apostle Paul wanted his readers to look to at all times Paul knew that we needed to see God's strength and believe and trust in this power and Paul also knew that this power of God that he describes in verse 19 is most clearly displayed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's what Paul wants us to see. That's what we need to see on this Easter Lord's Day. And as we examine this passage, that's exactly what we're going to find. Specifically, this passage draws our attention to three places where we can look in order to see the power of God and the resurrection of Christ. Three three places that we can look if you want to see resurrection power. If you want to see the powerlessness of man, 
If you want to see the, the impotence of human beings against the force of death, turn on the news. But if you want to see the power of God, then you can see it right here from this text. As, as the world remains embroiled in the fear of death that accompanies a global pandemic, here is where you can look to be reminded of the power of God in the resurrection. In the first place where Paul would have us to look to see the power of God in the resurrection is found in verse 20, where we see that this power has been revealed in the person of Christ. The person of Christ. In other words, if you want to see the infinite, divine, gracious, and effective power of God on display, then look no further than Christ Jesus. Now, since Jesus is God himself, he possesses divine power. And then when Jesus took upon himself a human nature, he came into this earth and by his work, he perfectly revealed that power to us. And in particular, Paul points to Christ's work in the resurrection as the ultimate revelation of the victorious power of God. Notice verse 20 begins speaking of the power that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead Paul's pointing to the power of God at work in the resurrection the the power that verse 19 describes it is most clearly seen in the work of raising Christ from the dead and and by the way this verse confirms for us the the literal death of Christ on the cross Jesus truly died on the cross this is not some epic tale meant to give us a moral lesson. Christ died on the cross and he had to die on the cross because the wages of sin is death and Christ came into this world to pay the penalty of sin so that sinners like you and I could be saved. He had to die and as Paul makes it clear here, he did die. But not only did he die, he also was resurrected. He has risen. He is risen today. And by the way, not only does this text remind us of this fact, it also confirms the the historicity of it. Again, this isn't a fairy tale. This isn't a made-up story. This isn't some great uh, 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 moral narrative that helps us see the power of good over evil. No, this is Christ bearing the weight of sin paying the sacrifice for sin through his death, and then rising triumphantly to defeat death. Paul is confirming a literal resurrection of Christ. And and this is the consistent witness of Scripture. If you claim to be a Christian, if you claim to believe in the Bible, you have to believe in the literal, literal resurrection of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 7 says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scripture, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. In other words, the resurrection that we're celebrating on this morning is a historic, a historical fact. And it's a historical fact, a historical event that demonstrates the power of God in the person of Christ Jesus. In in the resurrection, we see the the power of who Christ is. Romans 1.4 says that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead. The the resurrection is a once-for-all definitive statement from God that Jesus is who He said He was. He is the Christ. He is God. 
But so too, this historical event of the resurrection is also a confirmation of the power of the gospel. It's confirmation that Jesus' sacrifice was effective to save sinners. Jesus is not still paying for sins. He paid for sins. And the resurrection confirms that. And this power of the resurrection, the power of Christ over death, is particularly amazing compared with our inability to stop this COVID-19 virus. If there's one thing that should happen as a result of this pandemic, it's that we should all be humbled. We should all be humbled. There's a part of me that's concerned that that's not happening because of all the opinionizing and pontificating I see from the highest levels of leadership to the regular common person. I worry that our pride is being puffed up as our own opinions are being proliferated amongst other people rather than being humbled by the fact that we are virtually helpless against a microscopic virus. We should be humbled by this. We should be humbled by this and it should cause us to look back to the power of the resurrection with even greater admiration because in the resurrection, Jesus demonstrates His absolute supremacy over all things, even death. That great enemy that we can't lick, Christ defeated death. That's why the power of the resurrection is the only way to be freed from the lifelong slavery of the fear of death. The only way to be freed from that is to believe in Christ, to believe in His resurrection, to be forgiven of your sins, to be given eternal life so that you no longer have to fear death. And if you do believe in Christ in this way, you can rest assured that He will not let you down. In fact, we know that not only because of the power that was demonstrated through His resurrection, but also the power that was demonstrated in in the person of Christ in His exaltation. Verse 20 goes on and says that not only did God raise Him from the dead, but also God seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places. Christ was not only raised from the dead, but He was exalted by the Father in heaven. He was put at the Father's right hand. And and the right hand here, as in the rest of Scripture, it represents the power of God. It represents the authority of God. Christ was exalted to a position of power and authority. When He ascended into heaven, He took His seat in heaven. He was exalted. And this is the confirmation that the gospel was, is powerful unto salvation, that His sacrifice was acceptable to the Father. Christ is with the Father in heaven now, where He is seated in power, and He is seated in victory. So this exaltation of Christ is just another historical event that demonstrates the power of God through the person of Christ. This is what, by the way, the psalmist was looking forward to in Psalm 110, where where David writes, The Lord, that's the Father, says to my Lord, that's the Messiah, that's Christ, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. What is that? That's Christ's ascension. He was seated at the right hand of the Father. He is enthroned as the Redeemer and as the King, but He's waiting at the right hand of the Father to return and reign over the earth as King, visibly. However, we do know that He has been exalted. He is seated on high now. And because of that, we can know for certain that His death was a sufficient sacrifice to save us from eternal death. If you've ever thought to yourself, well, yeah, I'm sure what Jesus did was great, but even He can't save me from the ways that I have sinned. 
then you need to turn right back to this passage and recognize the immense power of God demonstrated in the exaltation of Christ. Don't you doubt the work of Christ. Don't you think that you need to add to it. Don't you think that you need to look elsewhere. The fact that He has been exalted on high for what He did, it demonstrates the power and the efficacy of His work. We can know for certain that the gospel is true and powerful to save. And we can also know, because he was exalted, that, that he will return and reign again over all the earth. He's at the right hand of the Father. We don't have to doubt that he's coming back. We just have to wait on the timing of it. He's been exalted. It's, it's not in flux. We're not waiting for the ballots to be counted to see if Jesus wins and will reign or not. He will reign. He's seated on high. We'll talk about this more in a minute, but we're just waiting to see it. That's all. And this is an amazing truth for us to consider because since we know that Christ has been exalted on high before the Father, it means that we who are in union with Christ will also be exalted in Christ. In fact, look down the page at Ephesians chapter 2 beginning in verse 4. Ephesians 2, 4, it says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. You see the connection there? Christ was made alive through the resurrection. Now spiritually, we're made alive in Christ. And then Paul adds, By grace you have been saved. Verse 6 and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In other words, because Christ has been exalted, our exaltation in heaven is a sure thing. That's the power of Christ, and we see it in, uh, that's the power of God, and we see it in the person of Christ, especially His resurrection, especially His exaltation. If you need a faith-building reminder of the power of God in your life, then look to the person of Christ. And and to this, Paul gives us a a second place that we can look. Building on this idea of Christ's resurrection and exaltation, Paul would also encourage us to look not just to the uh, uh, person of Christ, but also in verses 21 and 22, to the position of Christ. In other words, the same divine power that raised Jesus from the dead and put Him at the right hand of the Father continues to be displayed as Christ rules from heaven. Now, in His divine nature and through His Spirit, Christ is with us. As Matthew 28 says, He's with us to the end of the age. As God, in His divine nature, He's omnipresent he's everywhere through his spirit he dwells within us and so god in christ is an ever present source of help in times of trouble and yet in his human nature we know that christ is still seated at the right hand of the father he's in heaven and in heaven jesus is exalted as our savior and he continues to do his saving work on our behalf through his intercession and preparation so so the sacrifice is done it is finished that's good friday he is risen that's easter sunday that is done and yet the son continues ceaselessly in heaven interceding for his people to protect us and in that way he is in heaven now preparing a place for us in fact remember what jesus told the disciples as he was preparing them for the cross in john chapter 14 verses 1 through 4 he said let not your hearts be troubled I wonder how many of you in these difficult times, whether it's because of health concerns or cultural concerns or financial concerns, have troubled hearts. Or or maybe you'd say your heart isn't troubled, but you're trying to fight off the trouble in your heart. What's the answer? Well, Jesus says it. Let not your hearts be troubled, John 14, 1. Believe in God, believe also in me. 
Why do our hearts as believers become troubled? It's because of weak faith, and it's because of our weak faith and looking to the person of Christ. So what does Christ do? He tells his disciples, here's what I want you to know about what I'm going to be doing. When I am seated at the right hand of my Father, here's what I'm going to be doing powerfully for you so that your hearts don't have to be troubled. What does he say? He says, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may also be, and you know the way to where I am going. If you've ever been tempted, or even in these circumstances, tempted to say, Jesus, where are you? Here's the answer. He's in heaven preparing a place for you. That's his position. He's been exalted on high. Now, we are looking forward to a day when Christ's reign will be consummated. It will be visible when he returns to the earth. But even now, the Apostle Paul points out that Christ is enthroned over all other powers. Paul says that he's been seated in the heavenly places. And then verse 21 says, far above all rule. This is the kind of power that might come from prominence or priority. This is uh, uh, the patriarch of a family who, who, who has priority over everybody else. Christ has priority over every other chief, every other ruler. Christ also is far above every authority. This is speaking of a power that might come through a personal authority. So like a parent has authority over a child and a boss has a providential authority over a worker and so on and so forth. There is no one who has a a providential authority that usurps Christ's authority. Paul also said that he's over every power. The word power here. It's talking about a power that comes from, from might or physical strength. We, we might think, it a, a think of it as military superiority. Or maybe if you're a school kid, this is the bully that can beat everybody else up. So you do what he says so you don't get beat up. What Paul's saying is there's, there's no bully that's more powerful than the Lord. There's no military that's mightier than the Lord Sabaoth. He's above every mighty power. Additionally, he's above every dominion. This is the kind of power that might come from your position, like a governor, a senator, a president, an elected official. Why why do they have authority over us? It's because of the position that they've been elected or appointed to. And what Paul is saying here is that no one is elected or appointed to a position that usurps the authority of Christ. In fact, Paul goes on to say that he is above every name that is named. And here we might think that that, that somebody's name is what gives them influence. That's what leadership is. Leadership is influence. So if you have fame, if you have influence, then you have power. And what Paul is saying here is that no one has more influence over what happens in this earth than Jesus Christ. And, and whether Paul here is talking about angelic powers, some think he's talking about demonic powers, or whether he's talking about earthly human powers, I think either way, the point is clear that Christ is above all. Christ's position is exalted above every possible power, physical or spiritual. As Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. In other words, Christ presently, right now, has a powerfully exalted position. Christ is on high. And, and this exalted position that Christ powerfully possesses is also an eternal position. 
Notice Paul says in verse 21 that he's far above all these other powers. And then he says at the end of verse 21, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. In other words, the position of Christ that he has received at his exaltation, in his ascension, in his session, it will extend uninterrupted throughout all of eternity. Now, there is a distinction that the scriptures make between Christ's current reign from heaven and even his millennial reign and even his eternal reign and the eternal state. We can distinguish between those visibly. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 8, it says, putting everything in subjection under his feet. So it's talking about Christ's rule right now. He's seated at the right hand. That's Christ's session. He, he is ruling. But then it goes on to say in verse 8, now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. But we will, right? And so we don't visibly see the reign of Christ as we will when he comes back to establish his kingdom on this earth. And yet he still possesses that same position now. Maybe from Ephesians we might understand it this way, that verse 10 of chapter 1 of Ephesians says that the plan of God for the fullness of time is to unite all things in Christ. In other words, there's, there's no more rebellion against Christ. There, there, there are no more rebellious people. Christ is undoing all the results of fallenness. If, if Adam's sin was the undoing of God's creation into sinful chaos, then Christ's reign is the uniting of all creation redemptively back to the glory of God. That's God's plan. And at this present day, all things are under Christ's rule, but all things are not yet united in Him in that way. That, by the way, is why we still have pandemics. That's why we still have to deal with the fallenness of this world. That's why there are still rebels who will mock God even in the midst of this. However, none of this changes the fact that the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ will always have this eternally exalted position. And this position is of immense power and authority. Verse 22 says, of this position... That and he, that's God the Father, put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. So just look at that phrase there at the beginning of verse 22. He put all things under his feet. What does that mean? That's victory. That's victory. In the ancient world, this is the way that you would describe uh, victory in establishing your kingdom. In fact, that's exactly how this language is used in Psalm chapter 8. That, that, that God has given Christ the victory and established His kingdom. This is how David described his kingdom in, in Psalm 8, 6, and it was, a, it was a foreshadowing of Christ's Davidic reign over all things. He has this position now. We look forward to when we see Him visibly reigning and fulfilling all the prophecies about His reign, but He has the position now. He's the ultimate divine king that God promised to send. And understand this, his royalty in heaven is not like the reign of the Queen of England. Queen of England has very little power. She, she, she records encouraging messages for her country, which are great. You know, watch, watch the queen and, and see what she says about this pandemic. Be encouraged by that, I guess, you know, the stiff upper lip and all. I don't know. But when it comes to actual authority and power in her kingdom, she has little. Christ is not king the way the Queen of England is queen. Christ has an actual authority over all things. And we might not see visibly how he is exercising that authority, but he is 
the entire universe is subject to the reign of King Jesus. And one day he will return as the judge of all those who rebelled against him and he will unite all things in himself. This is the position of Christ. And in this position, this authoritative, eternal, and glorious position, we are reminded of the power of God, which is above all other powers. So, so, so if you're looking to be reminded of, of the power of the resurrection in uh, the work of Christ, you, you look to His person, you look to His position, and then Paul would have us look in one other place to be reminded of the power of God in the resurrection. And that is to the people of Christ. The person of Christ, the position of Christ, and the people of Christ. In other words, more than just observing the power of the resurrection in Christ Jesus, you can actually experience the power of the resurrection through Christ Jesus. Christ came into this world not only to reveal the power of God, but also to share it with those who believe. Remember what we saw about God's power in verse 19? It's towards those who believe. Well, the power of the resurrection is for those who believe in Christ Jesus. Now, does this mean that through this power you can be immune from contracting the COVID-19 virus or any other disease and that you never die? Physically, no. Christ died physically. Paul died physically. But the point is that you can experience the power of new life in your heart now and the hope of eternal life that will not end. In fact, when you believe in Christ, you immediately experience resurrection power in the forgiveness of your sins. Is there any greater power that we experience than that? To know that because of the work of Christ in our lives, in our hearts, and at the cross, every sin that we have ever committed has been cleared and forgiven before God. I mean, if we were to catalog the the list of our vile sins and compare it to the infinite purity of God, it would be utterly astonishing and backbreaking to us. And yet to know that in Christ Jesus we can have every one of those sins forgiven to be released of the penalty we deserve for those sins. That is power. That's the power of the resurrection. And this power is for us as God's people. In fact, notice from this text how the church, the people saved by God's grace, we are the ones who are able to experience this power in our own life. You say, well, how do we experience this power? Well, in part, we experience this power as the body of Christ. Verse 22 says, He put all things under His feet and gave Him as head over all things to the church. God the Father gave Christ to the church as our head and if he's our head then what does that mean we are verse 23 the church which is his body in the same way that Christ's physical body was resurrected we as the church experience the power of the resurrection in such a way that God can refer to us as if we were the body of Christ it's an illustration We're not literally Christ's body because Christ literally had a body. So it's an illustration. What's this illustration of the body pointing to? Well, it points to a number of important spiritual truths. But in this text, it is reminding us of the fact that just as Christ's physical body experienced the power of the resurrection, we too, as the body of Christ, the church, experience the power of the resurrection. Why? Because Christ is our head. And the fact that Christ is our head means that he possesses authority over the church, which he exercises through his word. But the headship of Christ also means that he is the source from which our life originates. From his resurrection life, we have newness of life. And through that newness of life, he provides us with everything that we need for life and godliness 
And that is when we submit to him as our head. The body of Christ was raised from the dead. And the church as the body of Christ has been raised from the deadness of our sins. But Paul doesn't leave it just at that. In addition to, to using the imagery of a body to describe our connection with Christ, Paul also makes it clear that the church experiences resurrection power as the fullness of Christ. Notice it says, which is the body. So the church is the body. And then in a parallel way, it also says that the church is the fullness of him who fills all in all. What does that mean? (laughs) Well, there's a lot of different ways to interpret this, a lot of debate over this. But I think in the context, the point is pretty uh, clear. That the church is filled with the power of God through the work of Christ, by the agency of the Holy Spirit. The the point here is not that Christ is lacking in something and we come along and fill Him up. No, no, it's actually the opposite. That, That Christ so fills His church with His resurrection power that we now can be described as the fullness of Christ because He fills us up. You say, well, wait a minute. I'm going through life, and i got to tell you, I would not have described yesterday as the fullness of Christ's power. I wouldn't like look at my circumstances and say, boy, it is so clear that, that I am just filled with the power of Him who fills all things. I'm just filled with the power of Him who, who who've entirely upholds the universe, Colossians 1 says. Why doesn't it feel like I have this resurrection power at work in me? Well, one reason could be because you're not a believer. If, if you have not experienced the, the, the liberating power of having your sins forgiven by the work of Christ, it may be that you need to submit to Christ and repent and believe for the very first time. But if you have done that and you're still struggling to see the work of Christ and His power at work in you, it may be that you're missing out on this power in your life for a number of reasons. For instance, you might have to be reminded that Christ's power is perfect for sanctification and purposeful for ministry. In other words, what is Christ's power affecting in us? It's affecting our sanctification our growth and holiness, and it's affecting our effectiveness for ministry. So, so Christ is powerfully working in you to make you more holy and to make you more useful, it, which means if you're looking for the power of Christ to kind of meet your demands and fulfill your own personal ambitions, then you're going to be disappointed. Why? Because your expectations are wrong. Boy, it doesn't seem like God's powerful in my life. Why? Well, I just I don't have much money. I don't have good health. My circumstances aren't great. I didn't get that job. I lost my job. Doesn't seem like God's all that powerful. Well, the problem is not with God's power. The problem is with your wrong expectations. You might have to adjust your expectations to see the power of Christ in you. You also might have to adjust your timetable. You see, God's power will be vindicated in eternity, not on our timeline. God's power will be demonstrated through His eternal purposes. God is working all things together for our eternal good, not just our momentary good. We love immediate payoff so much that we often would trade eternal good for temporary gratification. God is not going to empower that kind uh, of misunderstanding and misuse of our priorities. No. God is working for our eternal good, so it may be that He has us going through difficulties now, not because He's weak, but because He is working out His power in our lives for eternal good. Look, believer, you might be struggling to trust in the power of God to protect you right now. You might be trying to uh, constantly fixate in all these ways that you can protect your family from this disease or, or protect your family from the financial fallout and, and, and your mind might be consumed with that. Like, it's not wrong to take 
reasonable precautions. It's not wrong to do those things. I'm not saying don't do those things. But when your mind is infatuated with all the ways that you can prevent any possibility of ever being uh, 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 infected with this or, or you're stockpiling goods just in case that this is the end of the world, which, by the way, just pre-trib rapture, that'll, that'll, that'll cure you of that prep tendency. But if your mind is fixated on all these things, as if that's a solution, you might have to turn your focus back to the eternal work that God is doing through His power. And if you're doubting the power of God now, just know that when you're in heaven, no one there is going to be doubting the power of God. God's power will be vindicated on His timetable, His eternal timetable. And we have to keep that in mind. We also have to keep in mind And this one's the one that we lose track of the easiest. We also have to keep in mind that God's power is best displayed in our life not through our own personal strength, but through our perpetual weakness. The Apostle Paul experienced this. The Apostle Paul prayed for deliverance from this thorn in his flesh which we won't get into the details of that just to say that it was a weakness a frustration in his life and he prayed that it would be taken away and God's answer was no in fact 2 Corinthians 12 8 says three times I pleaded with the Lord about this that it should leave me but he said to me my grace is sufficient for you I don't need to change your circumstances because you already have enough grace to endure your circumstances. So my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. And then he says, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul's response to the Lord's instruction, therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You see how Paul learned a principle from God there that transcended the thorn in his flesh. But Because he went on to say, look, not only am I going to view this thorn in my flesh as a way to honor God and demonstrate his power, but also... Every weakness, every insult, every hardship, every persecution, every calamity. I am going to be content with them as though they are from God, knowing that when I am weak and I am trusting God, then His power will be more clearly displayed through me. Friends, I think that's exactly what the Lord is doing in the church in our own day. His desire is not for the church to fight and battle for human power and strength to the last breath. His desire is to display His strength through our contented faith in whatever He is doing. In other words, you let the world around you freak out all they want. But as you trust in God, His power will be evident through you. If you want to see the power of God, you look to the people of Christ, those whom he saved through his death. In the people of Christ, we see the power of God. At least we should. You remember that school sprinkler system I told you about earlier? School built this sprinkler system to protect all their kids. It was the most powerful sprinkler system in the world. They they said in their own newspaper clipping. Well, what's interesting is Seven years later, this was just after World War II, the the small community began to expand and there was a need to renovate the school to make more room. And in the process of this renovation, this small school discovered that they had never hooked up their sprinkler system to the water. They had an incredibly powerful, world-class sprinkler system, but Because of their own negligence, there was no water going to it whatsoever. Now, thankfully, they never needed the sprinklers. Nobody was harmed by that mistake. 
But the same will not be true for you if you neglect the power of the resurrection. You must submit to Christ or else the power of the resurrection will be useless for you. And if you are a believer who has submitted to Christ, you must constantly bow before His power so that you can be useful even in these times. The power of God that is displayed in the resurrection of Christ, it's the only solution to death. Which means if you see what's going on and it makes you afraid to die, then what you need to do is to turn to Christ and believe in the one who defeated death. Like I said, being a Christian can't save you from COVID-19 or eventually dying of something. But it will most assuredly save you from eternal death in hell. The power of the resurrection of Christ guarantees the eternal life of every person who trusts in the God of the Bible. If the news has you battling anxiety, if you need to be reminded of God's infinite, divine, gracious, and effective power, then this is where you need to look. The resurrection of Christ. You need to look at His person. You need to look at His present position and you need to look at what He has done already for His people. Like I told you, this is the strangest Easter I have ever experienced. But it is also the perfect time for us to consider the power of the resurrection. We pray with me. Lord, we do thank you for this power that you have not only demonstrated through Christ Jesus, but you have also offered to us in the gospel. Lord, I pray that all those who may hear these words from this study today would believe in this truth. If they've never believed, I pray that you would bring them to repentance, that they might believe in you for the very first time. If they have believed in you, I pray that you would strengthen their faith in you. Give them strong faith. Give them spiritual eyes so that they can see and discern what it is that you are doing. And Lord, we pray, especially now in these times, that you would give us the contentedness, the humility, and the endurance to allow you to demonstrate your power through our weaknesses. Lord, we also pray that even as you sustain our soul through these studies together, that you would quickly allow us to be back together again so that we can worship you together and bring you glory. Lord, we pray all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, it's certainly a joy to be able to enjoy a time of study in this way with all of you on this Resurrection Sunday. And even as we're reminded of the power of God and as we close out our study, I just want to do so with one final encouragement from Scripture. In Ephesians chapter 3, Verses 20 and 21, it says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever and all God's people in front of their computers and in person said amen. Thank you.